story seven of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven enemies about ten o'clock of a dark september evening the zemsto dr kirilov's only son six-year-old andrey died of diphtheria as the doctor's wife dropped on to her knees before the dead child's cot and the first paroxysm of despair took hold of her the bell rang sharply in the hall when the diphtheria came all the servants were sent away from the house that very morning kirilov himself went to the door just as he was in his shirt-sleeves with his waistcoat unbuttoned without wiping his wet face or hands which had been burnt with carbolic acid it was dark in the hall and of the person who entered could be distinguished only his middle height a white scarf and a big extraordinary pale face so pale that it seemed as though its appearance made the hall brighter is the doctor in the visitor asked abruptly i'm at home answered kirilov what do you want oh you're the doctor i'm so glad the visitor was overjoyed and began to seek for the doctor's hand in the darkness he found it and squeezed it hard in his own i'm, I'm very very glad we were introduced i am abukin had the pleasure of meeting you this summer at mr Nuchev's i am very glad to have found you at home for god's sake don't say you won't come with me immediately my wife has been taken dangerously ill i have the carriage with me from the visitor's voice and movements it was evident that he had been in a state of violent agitation exactly as though he had been frightened by a fire or a mad dog he could hardly restrain his hurried breathing and he spoke quickly in a trembling voice in his speech there sounded a note of real sincerity of childish fright like all men who are frightened and dazed he spoke in short abrupt phrases and uttered many superfluous quite unnecessary words i was afraid i shouldn't find you at home he continued while i was coming to you i suffered terribly oh dress yourself and let us go for god's sake it happened like this Popchinsky came to me alexander simonovitch you know him we were chatting then we sat down to tea and suddenly my wife cries out presses her hands to her heart and falls back in her chair we carried her off to her bed and i rubbed her forehead with sal volatile and i splashed her with water she lies like a corpse i'm afraid that her heart's failed oh let us go her father too died of heart failure kirilov listened in silence as though he did not understand the russian language when abukhin once more mentioned papchinsky and his wife's father and once more began to seek for the doctor's hand in the darkness the doctor shook his head and said drawling each word listlessly excuse me i, I can't go five minutes ago my son died is that true abukhin whispered stepping back my god what an awful moment to come it's a terribly fated day terribly what a coincidence and it might have been on purpose abukhin took hold of the door handle and drooped his head in meditation evidently he was hesitating not knowing whether to go away or to ask the doctor once more listen he said eagerly seizing kirilov by the sleeve I, I fully understand your state god knows i'm ashamed to try to hold your attention at such a moment but what can i do think yourself who can i go to there isn't another doctor here besides you for heaven's sake come i'm not asking for myself it's not i that's ill silence began Kirilov turned his back to Abukhin, stood still for a while, and slowly went out of the hall into the drawing-room. To judge by his uncertain, machine-like movement, and by the attentiveness with which he arranged the hanging shade on the unlighted lamp in the drawing-room, and consulted a thick book which lay on the table, at such a moment he had neither purpose nor desire, nor did he think of anything and probably had already forgotten that there was a stranger standing in his hall the gloom and the quiet of the drawing-room apparently increased his insanity 
as he went from the drawing-room to his study he raised his right foot higher than he need felt with his hands for the doorpost and then one felt a certain perplexity in his whole figure as though he had entered a strange house by chance or for the first time in his life had got drunk and now was giving himself up in bewilderment to the new sensation a wide line of light stretched across the bookshelves on one wall of the study this light together with the heavy stifling smell of carbolic acid and ether came from the door ajar that led from the study into the bedroom the doctor sank into a chair before the table for a while he looked drowsily at the shining books then rose and went into the bedroom here in the bedroom dead quiet reigned everything down to the last trifle spoke eloquently of the tempest undergone of weariness and everything rested the candle which stood among a close crowd of files boxes and jars on the stool and the big lamp on the chest of drawers brightly lit the room on the bed by the window the boy lay open-eyed with a look of wonder on his face he did not move but it seemed that his open eyes became darker and darker every second and sank into his skull having laid her hands on his body and hid her face in the folds of the bedclothes the mother now was on her knees before the bed like the boy she did not move but how much living movement was felt in the coil of her body and in her hands she was pressing close to the bed with her whole being with eager vehemence as though she were afraid to violate the quiet and comfortable pose which she had found at last for her weary body blankets cloths basins splashes on the floor brushes and spoons scattered everywhere a white bottle of lime water the stifling heavy air itself everything died away and as it were plunged into quietude the doctor stopped by his wife thrust his hand into his trouser pockets and bending his head on one side looked fixedly at his son his face showed indifference only the drops which glistened on his beard revealed that he had been lately weeping the repulsive terror of which we think when we speak of death was absent from the bedroom in the pervading dumbness in the mother's pose in the indifference of the father's face was something attractive that touched the heart the subtle and elusive beauty of human grief which it will take men long to understand and describe and only music it seems is able to express beauty too was felt in the stern stillness kirilov and his wife were silent and did not weep as though they confessed all the poetry of their condition as once the season of their youth passed away so now in this boy their right to bear children had passed away alas for ever to eternity the doctor is forty-four years old already grey and looks like an old man his faded sick wife is thirty-five andre was not merely the only son but the last in contrast to his wife the doctor's nature belonged to those which feel the necessity of movement when their soul is in pain after standing by his wife for about five minutes he passed from the bedroom lifting his right foot too high into a little room half filled with a big broad divan from there he went to the kitchen after wandering about the fireplace and the cook's bed he stooped through a little door and came into the hall here he saw the white scarf and the pale face again at last sighed abukwan seizing the door handle let us go please the doctor shuddered glanced at him and remembered listen i've told you already that i can't go he said livening what a strange idea doctor I, I made of flesh and blood too i fully understand your condition i sympathize with you abukwan said in an imploring voice putting his hand to his scarf but i am not asking for myself my wife is dying if you had heard her cry if you'd seen her face you would understand my insistence 
my god and i thought that you'd gone to dress yourself the time is precious doctor let us go i beg of you i can't come kirilov said after a pause and stepped into his drawing-room abukwin followed him and seized him by the sleeve you're in sorrow i i understand but i'm not asking you to cure a toothache or to give expert evidence but to save a human life he went on imploring like a beggar this life is more than any personal grief i ask you for courage for a brave deed in the name of humanity humanity cuts both ways kirilov said irritably in the name of the same humanity i ask you not to take me away my god what a strange idea i can hardly stand on my feet and you frighten me with humanity i'm not fit for anything now i won't go for anything with whom shall i leave my wife no no kirilov flung out his open hands and drew back and uh, and don't ask me he continued disturbed i'm sorry under the laws volume thirteen i'm obliged to go and you have the right to drag me by the neck well drag me but i'm not fit i'm not even able to speak excuse me it's quite unfair to speak to me in that tone doctor said abukwin again taking the doctor by the sleeve the thirteenth volume be damned i have no right to do violence to your will if you want to come if you don't then god be with you but it's not to your will that i apply but to your feelings a young woman is dying you say your son died just now who could understand my terror better than you abukwin's voice trembled with agitation his tremor and his tone were much more convincing than his words abukwin was sincere but it is remarkable that every phrase he used came out stilted soulless inopportunely florid and as it were insulted the atmosphere of the doctor's house and the woman who was dying he felt it himself and in his fear of being misunderstood he exerted himself to the utmost to make his voice soft and tender so as to convince by the sincerity of his tone at least if not by his words as a rule however deep and beautiful the words they affect only the unconcerned they cannot always satisfy those who are happy or distressed because the highest expression of happiness or distress is most often silence lovers understand each other best when they are silent and a fervent passionate speech at the graveside affects only outsiders to the widow and children it seems cold and trivial kirilov stood still and was silent when abukwin uttered some more words on the higher vocation of a doctor and self-sacrifice the doctor sternly asked is it far thirteen or fourteen versts i've got good horses doctor i give you my word of honour that i'll take you there and back in an hour only an hour the last words impressed the doctor more strongly than the reference to humanity or the doctor's vocation he thought for a while and said with a sigh well let us go he went off quickly with a step that was now sure to his study and soon after returned in a long coat abukwin delighted danced impatiently round him helped him on with his overcoat and accompanied him out of the house outside it was dark but brighter than in the hall now in the darkness the tall stooping figure of the doctor was clearly visible with the long narrow beard and the aquiline nose beside his pale face abukwin's big face could now be seen and a little student's cap which hardly covered the crown of his head the scarf showed white only in front but behind it was hid under his long hair believe me i'm able to appreciate your magnanimity murmured abukwin as he helped the doctor to a seat in the carriage we'll whirl away luke dear man drive as fast as you can do the coachman drove quickly first appeared a row of bare buildings which stood along the hospital yard it was dark everywhere save that at the end of the yard a bright light from some one's window broke through the garden fence and three windows in the upper story of the separate house seemed to be paler than the air 
then the carriage drove into dense obscurity where you could smell mushroom damp and hear the whisper of the trees the noise of the wheels awoke the rooks who began to stir in the leaves and raised a doleful bewildered cry as if they knew that the doctor's son was dead and abuquin's wife ill then began to appear separate trees a shrub sternly gleamed the pond where big black shadows slept the carriage rolled along over an even plain now the cry of the rooks was but faintly heard far away behind soon it became completely still almost all the way kirilov and abukwin were silent save that once abukwin sighed profoundly and murmured a terrible pain one never loves his nearest so much as when there is a risk of losing them and when the carriage was quietly passing through the river kirilov gave a sudden start as though the dashing of the water frightened him and he began to move impatiently let me go he said in anguish i'll come to you later i only want to send the attendant to my wife she's all alone abukwin was silent the carriage swaying and rattling against the stones drove over the sandy bank and went on Kirilov began to toss about in anguish and glanced around. Behind, the road was visible in the scant light of the stars and the willows that fringed the bank disappearing into the darkness. To the right, the plain stretched smooth and boundless as heaven. On it, in the distance here and there, dim lights were burning, probably on the turf pits to the left parallel with the road stretched a little hill tufted with tiny shrubs and on the hill a big half-moon stood motionless red slightly veiled with a mist and surrounded with fine clouds which seemed to be gazing upon it from every side and guarding it lest it should disappear in all nature one felt something hopeless and sick like a fallen woman who sits alone in a dark room trying not to think of her past the earth languished with reminiscence of spring and summer and waited in apathy for ineluctable winter wherever one's glance turned nature showed everywhere like a dark cold bottomless pit whence neither kirilov nor abukwin nor the red half-moon could escape the nearer the carriage approached the destination the more impatient did abukwin become he moved about jumped up and stared over the driver's shoulder in front of him and when at last the carriage drew up at the foot of the grand staircase nicely covered with a striped linen awning and he looked up at the lighted windows of the first floor one could hear his breath trembling if anything happens i shan't survive it he said entering the hall with the doctor and slowly rubbing his hands in his agitation but i can't hear any noise that means it's all right so far he added listening to the stillness no voices or steps were heard in the hall for all the bright illumination the whole house seemed asleep now the doctor and abukwin who had been in darkness up till now could examine each other the doctor was tall with a stoop slovenly dressed and his face was plain there was something unpleasantly sharp ungracious and severe in his thick negro lips his aquiline nose and his faded indifferent look his tangled hair his sunken temples the early grey in his long thin beard that showed his shining chin his pale grey complexion and the slipshod awkwardness of his manners the hardness of it all suggested to the mind bad times undergone an unjust lot and weariness of life and men to look at the hard figure of the man you could not believe that he had a wife and could weep over his child abukwin revealed something different he was robust solid and fair-haired with a big head and large yet soft features exquisitely dressed in the latest fashion in his carriage his tight-buttoned coat and his mane of hair you felt something noble and leonine he walked with his head straight and his chest prominent 
he spoke in a pleasant baritone and in his manner of removing his scarf or arranging his hair there appeared a subtle almost feminine elegance even his pallor and childish fear as he glanced upwards to the staircase while taking off his coat did not disturb his carriage or take from the satisfaction the health and aplomb which his figure breathed there's no one about nothing i can hear he said walking upstairs no commotion may god be good he accompanied the doctor through the hall to a large salon where a big piano showed dark and a luster hung in a white cover thence they both passed into a small and beautiful drawing-room very cosy filled with a pleasant rosy half-darkness please sit here a moment doctor said aboukin i i won't be a second i'll just have a look and tell them kirilov was left alone the luxury of the drawing-room the pleasant half-darkness even his presence in a stranger's unfamiliar house evidently did not move him he sat in a chair, looking at his hands, burnt with carbolic acid. He had no more than a glimpse of the bright red lampshade, the cello case, and when he looked sideways across the room to where the clock was ticking, he noticed a stuffed wolf as solid and satisfied as a Abukwin himself. It was still, somewhere far away in the other rooms, someone uttered a loud, Ah! a glass door probably a cupboard door rang and again everything was still after five minutes had passed kirilov did not look at his hands any more he raised his eyes to the door through which abukwin had disappeared abukwin was standing on the threshold but not the same man as went out the expression of satisfaction and subtle elegance had disappeared from him his face and hands, the attitude of his body, were distorted with a disgusting expression either of horror or of tormenting physical pain. His nose, lips, moustache, all his features were moving and, as it were, trying to tear themselves away from his face, but the eyes were as though laughing from pain. Abukwin took a long heavy step into the middle of the room, stooped, moaned and shook his fists deceived he cried emphasizing the syllable c e i she deceived me she's gone she fell ill and sent me for the doctor only to run away with this fool papchinsky my god abukwin stepped heavily towards the doctor thrust his white soft fists before his face and went on wailing shaking his fists the while she's gone off she's deceived me but why this lie my god my god why this dirty foul trick this devilish serpent's game what have i done to her she's gone off tears gushed from his eyes he turned on his heel and began to pace the drawing-room now in his short jacket and his fashionable narrow trousers in which his legs seemed too thin for his body he was extraordinarily like a lion curiosity kindled in the doctor's impassive face he rose and eyed abukwin well where's the patient the patient the patient cried abukwin laughing weeping and still shaking his fist she's not ill but accursed vile dastardly the devil himself couldn't have planned a fouler trick she sent me so that she could run away with a fool an utter clown an alphonse my god far better she should have died i'll not bear it i shall not bear it the doctor stood up straight his eyes began to blink filled with tears his thin beard began to move with his jaw right and left what's this he asked looking curiously about my child's dead my wife in anguish alone in all the house i can hardly stand on my feet i haven't slept for three nights and i'm made to play in a vulgar comedy to play the part of a stage property i don't i, I don't understand it abukwin opened one fist flung a crumpled note on the floor and trod on it as upon an insect he wished to crush and i didn't see didn't understand he said through his set teeth 
brandishing one fist round his head with an expression as though someone had trod on a corn i didn't notice how he came to see us every day i didn't notice that he came in a carriage to-day what was the carriage for and i didn't see innocent i i don't i don't understand the doctor murmured what's it all mean it's jeering at a man laughing at a man's suffering that that's impossible i've never seen it before in my life with the dull bewilderment of a man who has just begun to understand that some one has bitterly offended him the doctor shrugged his shoulders waved his hands and not knowing what to say or do dropped exhausted into a chair well she didn't love me any more she loved another man very well but why the deceit why this foul treachery abukwin spoke with tears in his voice why why what have i done to you listen doctor he said passionately approaching kirilov you were the unwilling witness of my misfortune and i am not going to hide the truth from you i swear i loved this woman i loved her with devotion like a slave i sacrificed everything for her i broke with my family i gave up the service and my music i forgave her things i could not have forgiven my mother and sister i never once gave her an angry look i never gave her any cause why this lie then i do not demand love but why this abominable deceit if you don't love any more then speak out honestly above all when you know what i feel about this matter with tears in his eyes and trembling in all his bones abukwin was pouring out his soul to the doctor he spoke passionately pressing both hands to his heart he revealed all the family secrets without hesitation as though he were glad that these secrets were being torn from his heart had he spoken thus for an hour or two and poured out all his soul he would surely have been easier who can say whether had the doctor listened and given him friendly sympathy he would not as so often happens have been reconciled to his grief unprotesting without turning to unprofitable follies but it happened otherwise while abukwin was speaking the offended doctor changed countenance visibly the indifference and amazement in his face gradually gave way to an expression of bitter outrage indignation and anger his features became still sharper harder and more forbidding when abukwin put before his eyes the photograph of his young wife with a pretty but dry inexpressive face like a nun's and asked if it were possible to look at that face and grant that it could express a lie the doctor suddenly started away with flashing eyes and said coarsely forging out each several word why do you tell me all this i do not want to hear i don't want to he cried and banged his fist upon the table i don't want your trivial vulgar secrets to hell with them you dare not tell me such trivialities or do you think i have not yet been insulted enough that i'm a lackey to whom you can give the last insult yes abukwin drew back from kirilov and stared at him in surprise why did you bring me here the doctor went on shaking his beard you marry out of high spirits get angry out of high spirits and make a melodrama but where do i come in what have i got to do with your romances leave me alone get on with your noble grabbing parade your humane ideas play the doctor gave a side glance at the cello case the double bass and the trombone stuff yourself with capons but don't dare to jeer at a real man if you can't respect him then you can at least spare him your attentions what does all this mean abukwin asked blushing it means that it's vile and foul to play with a man i'm a doctor you consider doctors and all men who work and don't reek of scent and harlotry your footmen your mauvais ton very well but no one gave you the right to turn a man who suffers into a property how dare you say that abukwin asked quietly again his face began to twist about this time in visible anger 
how dare you bring me here to listen to trivial rubbish when you know that i'm in sorrow the doctor cried and banged his fists on the table once more who gave you the right to jeer at another's grief you're mad cried abukwin you're ungenerous i too am deeply unhappy and and unhappy the doctor gave a sneering laugh don't touch the word it's got nothing to do with you wasters who can't get money on a bill call themselves unhappy too a capon's unhappy oppressed with all its superfluous fat you worthless lot sir you're forgetting yourself abukwan gave a piercing scream for words like those people are beaten do you understand abukwan thrust his hand into his side pocket took out a pocket-book found two notes and flung them on the table there's your fee he said and his nostrils trembled you're paid you dare not offer me money said the doctor and brushed the notes from the table to the floor you don't settle an insult with money abukwan and the doctor stood face to face heaping each other with undeserved insults never in their lives even in a frenzy had they said so much that was unjust and cruel and absurd in both the unselfishness of the unhappy is violently manifest unhappy men are selfish wicked unjust and less able to understand each other than fools unhappiness does not unite people but separates them and just where one would imagine that people should be united by the community of grief there is more injustice and cruelty done than among the comparatively contented send me home please the doctor cried out of breath abukwan rang the bell violently nobody came he rang once more then flung the bell angrily to the floor it struck dully on the carpet and gave out a mournful sound like a death moan the footman appeared where have you been hiding damn you the master sprang upon him with clenched fists where have you been just now go away and tell them to send the carriage round for this gentleman and get the brougham ready for me wait he called out as the footman turned to go not a single traitor remains to-morrow pack off all of you i will engage new ones rabble while they waited abukwan and the doctor were silent already the expression of satisfaction and the subtle elegance had returned to the former he paced the drawing-room shook his head elegantly and evidently was planning something his anger was not yet cool but he tried to make as if he did not notice his enemy the doctor stood with one hand on the edge of the table looking at abukwan with that deep rather cynical ugly contempt with which only grief and an unjust lot can look when they see satiety and elegance before them a little later when the doctor took his seat in the carriage and drove away his eyes still glanced contemptuously it was dark much darker than an hour ago the red half-moon had now disappeared behind the little hill and the clouds which watched it lay in dark spots round the stars the brougham with the red lamps began to rattle on the road and pass the doctor it was abukwan on his way to protest to commit all manner of folly all the way the doctor thought not of his wife or andre but only of abukwan and those who lived in the house he just left his thoughts were unjust inhuman and cruel he passed sentence on abukwan his wife papchinsky and all those who live in rosy semi-darkness and smell of scent all the way he hated them and his heart ached with his contempt for them the conviction he formed about them would last his life long time will pass and kirilov's sorrow but this conviction unjust and unworthy of the human heart will not pass but will remain in the doctor's mind until the grave end of story seven